It's Monday, September 13th, 2021. Before I call the meeting to order, I would like to say a few things about how we will conduct this meeting. I want to acknowledge that COVID-19 is causing us to alter our usual procedures. Due to the ongoing pandemic, Council Chair Zelle has determined that it is not reasonable or prudent to conduct in-person meetings at this time. Accordingly, Met Council members will participate in this meeting by phone or other electronic means, and this transportation committee will be conducted under Minnesota Statute Section 13D.021. Because we are conducting the meeting electronically, all votes must be taken by roll call. Before we start the meeting, we need to establish whether there is a quorum. With that, Becky, can you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Here. Cummings. Here. Ferguson. Fredson. Here. Gonzalez. Here. Sterner. Aye. Here. Zirin. Zirin is present. Barber. Here. With that, I can call to order the meeting of the Metropolitan Council Transportation Committee for September 13th, 2021. Uh, next, first item on our agenda today is actually approval of the agenda. Uh, if there are no changes or additions to the agenda, we can move ahead to the meeting or the meeting minutes. All right, seeing and hearing no changes, we will deem the uh, agenda approved. Moving on to approval of the minutes. It's the minutes of the August 23rd, 2021 meeting. Did anyone have any changes or additions? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Motion to approve the minutes. Last meeting. Moved by Sterner. Is there a second? Second by Gonzalez. Seconded by Gonzalez. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Becky, would you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Barber. Aye. With that, the minutes are approved. Our next item is the TAC report. I believe we have David Fenley here today. Hello, good afternoon. Welcome, Chair David. Barber um, and council members. Now that other people are calling you Barb, I'm going to really struggle to not do that myself. <laughs> I will still of, answer, not to worry. <laughs> I have a lot of other barbs in my life, so I just might revert to barb. Um, it's great to be here with you all. Uh, the Transportation Accessibility Advisory Committee, we had another fantastic meeting this month um, on the 1st of September. I'll give you a quick update um, on stuff that we are working on. Um, we, we've had quite a number of um, updates on the relatively new Metro Transit app. And we've we've been providing feedback to um, to you all on that. It's it's really nice to see that it's rolling out in a in a very accessible manner, um, um, and yeah, it just makes everything easier for folks, uh, everybody, including folks with disabilities, when it comes to comes to booking tri booking trips. Um, we did have a great uh, department, I guess, um, meeting or or introduction from uh, from John. Levin um, at, at strategic initiatives. Uh, he, he, he really did a good job of laying out how, how strategic initiatives kind of brings together other departments and maybe builds capacity um, in those departments when, when, when things are happening. Um, and we had some, we had some thoughts on, on ways we can dig more into some of the data that they, that they like to use to uh, determine what 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 they can work on so i think we're going to probably schedule something again with him to get a little more weedy uh, uh with strategic in initiatives to see if we can we can um help out with some ideas there uh we will be having i would say probably the next month or two um our priority seating education uh promo video should be coming out maybe even sooner than that so that's exciting um one thing that 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 we were a little dismayed by, but do understand the logic behind is the reduction of the regular route fares. Uh, obviously, that's to increase ridership um, and, and that, how that was not transferred over to Metro Mobility, but we do understand the logic uh, behind that, even though it doesn't seem totally equitable. We're not necessarily looking to boost Metro Mobility ridership, um, um, but 
but your your the, the reasoning behind the decision that you made uh, does make sense. We we did have a a, a slight a, a a small idea on that. Maybe I can just plant the seed now in your heads. Rather than reducing the fare for metro mobility, um, the potential to further reduce the fare for passengers who have disabilities, because I know they already have a reduced fare on regular route and light rail. So just a thought, just a thought. Um, um, that, oh yeah, and we continue, we didn't get an update from the microtransit pilot in, in North Minneapolis this month, but we have been ongoingly working behind the scenes uh, to provide feedback um, on that on that RFP and that and that uh, micro transit program because um, it is fantastic to finally have at least a small area of the Twin Cities uh, to have some on demand fully accessible uh, uh, transportation which right now is doesn't really exist there are some taxis but who knows when they're going to be available so it's it's nice to have um, um some some on-demand accessible uh transportation available for for folks with disabilities that is everything i have i flew through my update so i'd be happy to answer any questions thank you david are there any questions from council members Uh, I don't see any, just a couple quick comments. Thank you for the feedback on the app and also the Metro Mobility, um, but also I am really excited to hear that you are involved behind the scenes with some of the work on the microtransit project um, because that is really meant to connect to everybody. And so um, I'm really happy to hear that you're engaged with that process and I would love to continue to hear your feedback on that. It's my pleasure. Thank you, Chair Barber and council members. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, next we're on to other reports. We have MTS Director. We have uh, Acting Director Amy Benowitz here today. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Just two items today. I believe I mentioned a few months ago that we would be kicking off our transit onboard survey this fall. This is a survey we do every five years to really survey our customers on um, trip purposes, origins, destinations, that type of information. And then we use it to augment our regional travel model. And I just wanted to let you know that the pretest for the transit onboard survey is actually starting tomorrow. And we will have survey takers out on a number of routes, including the A line, C line, the blue line, and the green line. Um, so this is just the pretest but then we'll continue with the actual survey in the coming weeks. So if you hear feedback from customers or anyone uh, curious about the transit onboard survey, definitely let me know when we can follow up with them. The second item I have today is just a quick update on our motor vehicle sales tax collections. Continued really good news on the MVES collections. We ended the state fiscal year, which ended actually at the end of June, and collections were up 113% over forecast, which is a little over 30 million uh, for the state fiscal year for us. And through July and August, we've had continued good collections, and at the moment, we're looking to end the year at up about 114%. So that's good fiscal news uh, for us on the transit side. And that's all I have, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank Are there you. questions from council members? All I have is that's really great news on MVEST. So that definitely helps us as we do some planning into the future here. So very good news. Um, now we're on to Metro Transit General Manager Quistra. Thank you, Chair Barber. I'll have a couple of just quick updates. Uh, one on COVID. Uh, we're now, since the start of the pandemic, we're at 506 cases among Metro Transit employees. As the Delta variant spreads, we continue to see uh, cases among employees rise. I have looked at June as a baseline of when we were at our low with only two cases total. July, we were at 14. In August, uh, we had 36 total cases. We remain 
focused on educating customers about our mask requirement, including providing masks to customers who try to board without a mask. Uh, I also want to mention that Metro Transit's uh, COVID incident command team continues to work towards implementing uh, the council's vaccine and test requirements that goes into effect on October 11th. This includes finalizing weekday testing options and the process for employees to submit information about vaccination data or their vaccination status rather. And we believe our program matches the uh, expectations for large employers announced by the president last week. So we think we're in good shape in that regard. Also want to talk a little bit about the St. Paul Public Schools. As you likely heard last week, uh, we're working with St. Paul Public Schools to help transport students to four high schools in the face of the school bus driver shortage that we're all sharing, I might add. School started last Thursday, and so far existing services on bus and LRT have been able to accommodate students in bus operations and, ser and with service development. We're continuing to try to refine bus assignments, place more 60-foot buses uh, on trips that are most likely to be used by the St. Paul Public School students to protect for overloads. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Are there questions from council members? Madam Chair. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Wes, I'm wondering if Saturday's driver outage, operator outage was an anomaly or is that something that we're continuing to see or where do we stand with that? Well, if for for rail, it's an anomaly, and I'll I'll give a little more detail on that. You know, we we go through, uh, we have a bus operator shortage currently, but we don't we have our full uh, staff complement for rail operators. We do have an unusual number of rail operators that are out with with long term sicknesses or needs or longer term. I shouldn't say long term, but longer term. But on Saturday, we felt like we had the the coverage we needed. Uh, for a Saturday schedule, but we ended up with seven additional calls in, call ins, sick call ins on, on Saturday. And I think that the news kind of came out that we lost trips and so forth. What really happened was we adjusted some 10 minute service down to 15 minute service. We adjusted some 15 minute service down to 20 minute service. We made we made adjustments to the schedule in that way so that the, fre the frequency was was lowered a little bit but typically by five minutes, I think in the evening hours, we reduced it by uh, a 20 minute schedule to a half hour schedule like by, by 10 minutes. So um, it, it, it was certainly something we don't wanna see happen and certainly something we haven't seen happen on rail with, with any frequency. I think we went for five straight years without, without uh, uh, missing rail, rail trips. So we have a good record on rail, but this is a combination of having a number of people that were that were called in sick prior to Saturday, uh, an unusual number and that we knew were going to be out and then having that added to by by seven that we did not expect. So that's that's really the background on that. Thanks for Thank asking. You. Thanks. Thank you, Wes. Are there additional questions from council members? All right, on to the rest of our business for the evening. There um, Tonight, there are no items on consent. So we'll move to our first non-consent item, which is business item 2021-241, the 2022 to 25 transportation improvement program. And we have Joe Barbaro here to present. Where is? Sorry, thanks Madam Chair. Okay. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the tip that uh, I just came back uh, to tab and tab recommended approval after a 45 day public comment period. Um, I believe I had a presentation in June, so the, a little bit of this might be reviewed, but I go through it pretty quickly. Um, so you can go to the next slide. So briefly, a tip is a uh, four year list of any, any transportation project that is funded in whole or part with federal funding. That is a, a, a federal law that any uh, urbanized area has to have uh, this type of a program. Um, MnDOT actually does a lot of the work on preparing the data that creates a TIP and they uh, go a little bit above and beyond. They have state funded projects included in the TIP as well. 
Um, that's not federally required, uh, but they do that, um, and it creates some some seamlessness uh, if funding funding sources are changed in any projects. So um, alongside federal funded projects or any projects that uh, impact air quality also need to be in the tip. So there might be um, locally funded projects if uh, if they're uh, impactful of air quality um, that might be in the tip. Um, and then uh, the tip itself is uh, is provided to MnDOT after it's approved and they'll incorporate into their state transportation improvement program or STIP. Any project uh, with federal funding uh, in order to get underway has to be in the STIP. Um, so uh, next slide. So um, I kind of touched on this a bit, but uh, the projects that you'll see in the tip are any transit projects that are programmed by providers with FTA formula funds. Those are more of your local projects, um, along with some of the really big, uh, big high profile projects. Um, roadway projects programmed by MnDOT um, with federal and state funds. MnDOT programs the majority of our roadway projects in the tip. Uh, regional solicitation projects. The regional solicitation makes up roughly a quarter of the tip. Um, in terms of uh, total federal dollars as well as total projects. Um, and then uh, we do have a small portion of Sherburne and Wright counties that are included in the urbanized area. This happened as a result of the 2010 census. Um, and there actually is also a small piece in Wisconsin across the old Stillwater Bridge. And uh, we haven't had a project in there for a few years, but we have had Wisconsin projects in the tip. Um, that's probably going to go away with the next census, that Wisconsin piece. Uh, and I imagine that the Sherburne and Wright counties will remain or even possibly expanded, but we do work with uh, other outside of uh, the Metro district to get those projects into the tip. Um, so the council approval that we're looking for in a couple of weeks would be for um, the entire 500 and some odd projects that we have in the draft tip. Um, next slide. So, this is the key criteria for um, not only for approving the TIP, but approving TIP amendments. And you get uh, this board approves a number of TIP amendments throughout the course of the year, usually about 25 or so per year. Um, the TIP needs to be uh, fiscally balanced. That is to say that it's not a wish list. It is a, uh, a program of projects that have a reasonable expectation to be funded. It needs to be consistent with our TPP um, that you'll be approving uh, every, every few years. Um, in conformity with Clean Air Act requirements, and that uh, that's where I reference uh, air quality impact projects need to be in there regardless of funding source, and there needs to be an opportunity for public input. And I'll talk a little bit about that uh, with our public comment period that we had over the summer. Next. So here's our schedule, just showing um, what's happened and happening. Uh, TAB did release the public, uh, the draft tip for public review in May. Uh, that ended on July 6th. Um, we had uh, comments from well over 100 commenters, and we'll talk a bit about that later. TAB uh, recommended the TIP itself for approval at its meeting last month. Here we are in the red at Transportation Committee, and then uh, hopefully the council approves on September 22nd. <clears throat> and then it's provided to MnDOT, who uh, takes our TIP as, long as, as well as other TIPs and all the projects not in urbanized areas and creates the STIP, State Transportation Improvement Program, and looks for approval from Federal Highway and Federal Transit Administrations, which usually occurs around November 1st. That uh, bottom bullet there is maybe a little bit on the pessimistic side. It's hopefully gonna be early November that that will be approved and then the TIP will be uh, in operation. So next. Um, this is a brief, uh, a brief little synopsis of how the five billion dollar four year program is is divided. Um, federal highway funds and federal transit funds make up roughly 60% of that uh, five billion dollars, and then local and state funding makes up the rest. So um, you'll see a lot of the local uh, funding is match of the federal funds. Uh, many of our programs, of course, have an 80-20 split requirement. Um, next. And this is just another way that it breaks down. This is by mode. You'll see about half of the half of the uh, program is um, transit projects. Mostly, uh, most of the rest of it is highway and road projects. Bike ped only. It says bike ped only because there are bike ped elements uh, as part of a number of the highway and roadway projects. And then other slash set of slides as TDM is sort of uh, 
projects that either don't fit into those modes or sometimes a set aside might be, for example, to replace lighting structures. We don't know where that's going to be in advance. And so they're a little more general as to location. Um, and so those things will be pulled from what's known as a set aside. Um, next. So I'm going to get into the public comment report a little bit. We work with um, communications on that. And uh, uh, Sarah Maskey is here if there's any really in-depth questions, but hopefully I can handle it. Um, so we'll move on to the next slide. So we released the public, uh, in May, TAB released the tip for public comment, the draft tip, uh, and that went through January, uh, July 6th. Um, you'll see that uh, this is a newer table we've had from the last two or three tips that, talks, that shows how many unique views we've had on our web pages, people that have been in, reached on Facebook or Twitter. Um, we had 150 people, or not people necessarily, individuals make comments for a total of over 475 comments. Um, and we did have one public meeting that had 26 attendees, but only one person um, decided to speak at that meeting. Um, you'll see examples of the interest groups that contacted us. Some of these are our, our own partners that participate a lot in the TAC tab process, the counties and cities that you see at the top. Then you'll see a number of um, nonprofit organizations that have an interest in transportation. Um, and you'll see that uh, you know we 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 go old school with the Star Tribune advertising, and we also reach out a lot on social media, and of course with the one public meeting. Uh, most of our comments come through email. Um, we did have, I think, one or two that were mailed. And then, of course, I mentioned the one in the public comment. Uh, I'm sorry, in the public meeting. Um, next slide. So I'm going to talk a bit about the themes that we saw. Um, and so uh, we had a lot of comments related to acknowledging climate change, the impact of, of transportation on air quality and climate change, um, and that sort of took form at times in prioritizing expanding transit, travel demand management, which is ways to um, sort of maximize the efficiency of our roadways in terms of air quality and, and emissions, and then bike and pedestrian projects um, as, as ways to have non-impactful transportation. Uh, we saw these uh, with frequency comments on those themes. And I think there's one more theme slide next. Um, a lot of comments on transitioning from diesel buses to electric, um, prioritizing uh, electric vehicle infrastructure um, and electric vehicle adop ad adoption, um, and uh, focusing on electric buses on poor air quality areas. And this is a general, how do we reduce vehicle miles traveled and accelerating um, redu and examining um, traffic fatalities uh, over the course of the pandemic, those have increase quite a bit. And so that's a concern is maybe looking at safety projects. Um, so these themes, you know, these are, are tricky themes that come out over the course of the summer when we're approving the tip at this point. Uh, these are more big scale things. And I think Amy's gonna talk a little bit more about those, uh, but these are things that sort of get addressed through the TPP process and other processes. So next slide, and that might be Amy's. Um, Amy, is this you or is this me? Um. I can I can take this one, Joe. So right. um, so Joe talked about the number of public comments we got this year, and for the past two years, we have really been surprised at the huge and rapid increase in commenters and comments. And um, as this slide indicates, the comments we're getting tend to be very high level, big picture. Almost none of them are about specific projects. Um, and so when we come to respond to the comments and the tip at its heart is a list of specific projects that we're gonna be funding over the next four years, it's really difficult uh, to figure out how to incorporate the feedback and um, one of the things that we had a long conversation with Tab a bit over is there seemed to be some surprise that there was not direct impact on the TIP itself. And so one of the things we're here to talk about a little bit today is that when we get these high level comments, 
we might not have a direct impact in the immediate tip, but we definitely use the comments, we listen to the comments. They're a big part of how we think about our planning activities into the future. Uh, they're a big part of how we think about uh, our process for updating the TPP. And so while in general, there is not a change to the tip in response to the comments received, uh, there is a big response in terms of what we're going to be doing in the future with our planning work. So next slide, please. Uh, so one of the things we wanted to point out is a number of studies that are either ongoing or that we will be implementing in the next year or so. And you will be approving our Unified Planning Work Program, which is the annual look at the planning work that we do. And I think that is coming next month. Uh, so a lot of these studies you will see directly in the UPWP. And I just wanted to point out a couple of studies in particular that relate to both the climate change, VMT, and the equity comments that we have been receiving over the past few public comment processes. I think uh, we were in front of this committee a few six months or so ago about the first project, a path to accelerate electric vehicle adoption in the region. That project is almost completed. It's developing a number of actions or strategies that we can implement in the region to help accelerate electric vehicle adoption. And this is not specific to transit vehicles, but really is looking at the vehicle fleet over the region as a whole and how can we encourage private individuals and businesses and what do we need to supply in terms of electrification network for that to happen. So that's a pretty big project we're looking forward to the results on. We also have our regional travel demand management study, the third bullet on this list. That study is really uh, going to develop, again, actions or strategies that the region should be taking to primarily encourage continued teleworking and use of alternative modes as we've seen during COVID. To some degree, we've had huge success during COVID in TDM and we wanna learn from that and make sure we continue to encourage that into the future. That is just gonna be kicking off late this year and then we'll go through next, next year and we'll highly inform our 2050 planning work. We have our equity evaluation of regional transportation investment. We're hoping to go out to bid for that in uh, just a matter of weeks and that will go all through next year really evaluating how we invest in transportation and taking an equity lens to those processes and coming up with actions and strategies to make the processes more equitable. We have a master contract uh, we will be implementing to do engagement with BIPOC populations, really looking for expertise and how we do that engagement and not kind of reinventing the wheel with every project, but being able to rely on ongoing contracts and expertise to help us do that with each of our projects. Um, and then uh, further down the list, we have our regional transportation and climate change measures. This is work we're gonna be doing jointly with MnDOT. The VMT uh, as a measure and as a target and what we do with VMT will be highly embedded into that specific project. It will also identify other climate change measures across the modes that we should be implementing and potentially setting targets for. And again, that work will highly inform the 2050 planning work uh, that is coming up in the next couple of years. So we have a lot going on, a lot of it related to climate change, a lot of it related to equity. And we just wanted to kind of hit home on that point because as I said earlier, while we don't see specific changes to the tip, we do pay attention to all of the comments and themes that we identify across our public comment processes. Uh, I'm not sure, is there a next slide? Oh, 
that's what I thought. We should be done. So I can take any questions or Joe can take any questions too. Are there any questions from council members? Council member Chambliss. Um, not really any questions. Um, I'm just really um, very pleased with the insight that um, was um, taken in terms of putting these goals together and very comprehensive, um, the electrification in the region, very exciting. I'm sure our um, stakeholders are gonna be very pleased with that. And just being you know, forward thinking in terms of um, you know, what's, what's been happening recently with uh, the pandemic and how the teleworking is um, having a much bigger impact than we had ever imagined. And, and what does that mean for how we work and I'm kind of interested in how that um, evaluation is going to impact how we work at Metropolitan Council as well, uh, because we have to be the role models for that. So thank you so much. And thank you for your comments, Reva, and thanks to Amy, Steve, Joe, Sarah, because they put a lot of thought into this and I, I really think it's really reflected well in the presentation today. Um, are there any other questions or comments from council members? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-241. Uh, I recommend uh, approving that motion. Very good, move by Chambliss. Is there a second? Uh, second by Gonzalez. Seconded. Uh, seconded by Gonzalez. Is there any other discussion? All right, seeing and hearing none. Becky, would you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson, Fredson, aye. Gonzalez, aye. Sterner, aye. Zirin, aye. Barber, aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you very much, and thank you, Joe and Amy, for presenting. Thank uh, you. Yep, absolutely. Next, we're on to business item 2021-227, a joint committee item. It is the 2021 third quarter budget amendment, and we have Ed Petrie and Heather Augustin Huebner here to present. Good afternoon, Chair Committee members. Uh, Chair, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Welcome. Great. Thank you very much. Once again, Ed Petrie, I'm Director of Finance with Metropolitan or with Metro Transit. And with me this evening is Heather Augustin Hebner. She's the Director of Finance and Administration for Metropolitan Transportation Services. Uh, we're going to go through the third quarter capital and operating budget amendments. I will go through the Metro Transit portion, stand for any questions, then turn it over to Heather. Uh, the, the budget amendment this, this evening or the item is the 2021 Unified Budget, uh, 2021 Budget Amendment for third quarter. Uh, the amendment this evening uh, includes both changes to the capital and the operating amendment. Uh, this, this amendment, I do want to make the point, it's one of our smaller amendments we do have during the year. The second quarter amendment, amendment that, which is one that we brought in last quarter, is generally our largest one because that generally reflects when all the federal funds have been applied for, have been approved, we bring the funds in. So this is one of the smaller ones that we're bringing forward. Uh, so on the Metro Transit portion of it, I will move into that first. Our, the Metro Transit portion on the capital side, first of all, includes uh, three administrative adjustments for the Green Line. We're utilizing the funds within the project, moving them within various projects within the Green Line so we can use and spend out the money. We're also then closing five projects as they are now completed. And we're going to close those projects and remove any balances that are left, move it back into the capital program. But the meat of the budget amendment is off on authorizing new projects for Metro Transit. Uh, this is, as I mentioned, it's one of our smaller amendments for Metro Transit. Uh, the 2021 federal grants have now been completed, authorized, approved by the federal government, and then they're now ready to bring the rest of the projects into our capital budget. So I'll go over some of those budget adjustments. First of all, the first one includes a Metro Gold Line. Actually with the Metro Gold Line, we are actually returning some remaining funds. We're done with the project development phase. So there's some funds remaining that will now re be returned to the funding partners, Washington County, Ramsey County, and Ramsey Regional uh, County Railroad Authority. So we'll remove those funds. But the, the, the other portion of the project is actually bringing in funds based upon the completion of the federal grants, and with the associated uh, match. Uh, many of these projects, all the projects first saw were in the plan CIP. Council adopted uh, uh, capital budget and plan that you adopted back in December, bringing those projects forward. 
For Metro Transit, some of the projects include LRT collision, reconstruction equipment, uh, HASTA scheduling and software upgrades, ADA bus stops, non-revenue vehicle and equipment replacements, uh, bus repair associated capital maintenance, uh, BRT midlife overhauls for our A-line buses, communication equipment, and Metro Transit fuel management systems. So with that, uh, Madam Chair, uh, that's the capital portion of the Metro Transit uh, amendment. I would stand for any questions before I move on to the operating. Sorry, I unmuted my, or muted myself. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, so um, I, uh, any questions from council members? All right, uh, seeing and hearing none, go ahead with the operating side. Great, thank you, Chair. On the operating side for Metro Transit, uh, uh, we're making just three adjustments to the 2021 operating budgets. The adjustments are for salary and benefit increases that were not originally included in the 2021 operating budget. When we originally built the 2021 operating budget, all co labor contracts and agreements, et cetera, were not settled. So now as the result of settling these agreements, we now know uh, what the labor increases are gonna be. So we're bringing in uh, those adjustments in the 2021 budget. It's for the bus system, it's approximately $10.1 million. Our rail system, it's just under 1.7 million. And for North Star, it is 153,000. So these are adjustments to the 2021 operating budgets for Metro Transit. So with that, Madam Chair, I would stand for any questions before we turn it over to Heather. All right, any questions from council members? One question. Uh, council Member Chambliss. Okay, so um, if I understand correctly, the adjustments are based on what um, ended up being the results of the union um, discussions and compromises, is that correct? Yeah. Madam Chair, uh, committee members, that's correct. Because when we originally built the 2021 budget, we did not know what those final parameters were going to be. So now that they've been settled, we can now implement that into the 2021 budget. That is correct. Okay. And it looks like you have um, the biggest difference in Metro Transit bus operations. Um, and Madam Chair, know... Madam Chair, committee members, and the reason that would would be, for example, is with the with the ATU contract. The ATU contract represents all the operators, mechanics, fuels, parts, and cleaners. So it's the largest portion of the FTEs for the council. Okay, thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Any additional questions? All right, thank you, Ed. We'll turn it over to Heather. Hi, right, Madam Chair, are you able to hear me? Yes, I am. Thank you. Welcome. Right, so again, Heather Augustin Huebner, the Finance Director for MTS. Similar to Metro Transit, this is a really small budget amendment for MTS. So there's two projects on the capital side I want to call out. First, we're bringing in just about $1.3 million in federal funds and about $305,000 of RTC funds to purchase three 30-foot buses for Southwest Transit. It's for an expansion grant that was awarded by the Transportation Advisory Board through the regional solicitation, and the council is providing the match on this project, and it was in the CIP. Second, we're bringing in just over $1.6 million of RTC to begin implementation of a system-wide fare box replacement project. This is a large project. Um, you're gonna be seeing us roll this out in phases over the next couple years. The MTS side of the budget will house the replacement um, dollars for not only the MTS fleet, but the regional fleet. So the suburban transit providers will be covered under our budget as well. So if you if you hear, well, who's paying for the suburban transit provider portion, that, that side of the implementation project resides in our budget. Lastly, you're gonna see two projects that are opening and closing in the same budget amendment. As we were doing um, normal kind of reconciliation after the Q2 budget amendment, we identified an administrative error. And to correct that error, we needed to reopen the project and then close it. So what the end result of this is going to be is there's going to be $546 moving to the small bus undesignated account. 
and um, $1,872 to the MBTA undesignated account. So it's a really small dollar amount, but we wanted to make sure that we brought it through and got all the dollars exactly right. Um, on the operating side, we are doing the same thing you just heard from Edit Metro Transit. So we're going to be increasing salaries and benefits by uh, 228480 a lot smaller dollar amount. MTS has a much smaller number of employees as most of our services um, provided by contracted service providers rather, rather than in-house staff. So this budget amendment demonstrates a commitment towards asset preservation and also supports the thrive outcomes of stewardship by assessing the future needs, responsible planning and management of resources for Metro Transit and Metropolitan Transportation Services. The amendment adds funding that reflects a strategic investment in regional infrastructure that will promote economic competitiveness and create prosperity for the region. Our requested action is that the Metropolitan Council authorize the 2021 unified budget as indicated and in accordance with the attached tables, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Heather. Are there any questions from council members? All right, seeing and hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-227-JT. This is Fred, and I move the staff recommendation. It's moved by Fredson. Is there a second? Second by Chambliss. Seconded by Chambliss. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none, Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you very much, Ed and Heather. Thank you. Next, we are on to business item 2021-239. It's Southwest LRT North Shore Track Service Amendment 2 for Bass Lakes for Freight Ma Rail Maintenance and Repair. And we have Jim Alexander here to present. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, uh, Council Members. This is Jim Alexander, Project Director for the Southwest LRT. So tonight, uh, I have an item for an amendment to an existing contract we have, and I'll give you a little background on this first. Uh, we're talking about the Bass Lake Spur, which is the freight line that the uh, that the Southwest LRT will run alongside, essentially from uh, St. Louis Park out to Hawkins. There's really two segments of this. Uh, it's about a 6.8 mile long uh, freight line, which the council owns as part of the agreements we made with uh, with the railroads uh, as we started this project. And uh, it's uh, there's a Bass Lake Spur East, which is being uh, maintained by our civil contractor, Lund McCrossan Joint Venture. And then there's a West part that is being uh, uh, maintained by uh, North Shore Track Services. And that's under an existing contract we have with them that uh, was signed back in June of 2019. And uh, we uh, have been working with those folks for quite some time on that contract, and we uh, realized we need to uh, add some more money uh, to that contract to uh, do some uh, urgent repairs uh, back in uh, in earlier this year. But uh, we are looking to do a a, a new uh, procurement, and that was uh, that's currently in process. We received one bid back in July of this year, and that's certainly that's currently being evaluated for responsiveness. And so we're coming up to a time where we we need to uh, continue with some repairs that are, are needed for that uh, western segment of the freight rail line. And uh, if uh, if a rebid is uh, is uh, is is necessary for that uh, procurement that we went out on, uh, we will need to amend this contract. So tonight's uh, item is to add six hundred eleven thousand seven hundred eighty six hundred seventy eight thousand dollars and fifty three cents. Uh, to the uh, to the existing contract for a total of uh, two million two hundred ninety five thousand one hundred fifty one dollars and one cent uh, to that contract. If uh, if uh, if there if it finds that the rebid is not necessary, then amendment two will not be pursued uh, at this juncture. So um, we didn't want to mention the original the original contract that we did have signed back in twenty nineteen did not have a DBE goal. And uh, on this new procurement, there has been assessed a nine percent uh, goal by OEO uh, for that for that uh, the the new contract. 
So Madam Chair, I have item tonight uh, that uh, the, the Met Council authorized the regional administrator to negotiate and execute amendment number two to contract 18P387 with North Shore Track Services for Bass Lake Spur freight rail maintenance and repair to add $611,678.53 for a total contract amount of $2,295,151.01. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you, Jim. Uh, uh, Councilmember Cummings. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Alexander, it seems to me I remember from before that you mentioned that this is very specialized work and there are not a lot of firms that do this type of work, which is the reason that there are a few bids. Is that, am I remembering correctly? Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Council Member, that is correct. It's, uh, in fact, I think the original procurement, we, we may have just received one, if not uh, one, we, maybe we had two proposers, but we only received one proposer on this recent uh, solicitation. So it is rather, rather, rather limited. And maybe before I go on, I just, just want to mention another important point why we're doing this is this, this is a requirement uh, that we have with our, with our existing agreement with Twin City and Western Railroad for the construction and co-location agreement that we have in place that we are have the responsibility of taking care of this uh, of this line. And the project specifically has responsible for the cost of these services until we get to revenue service for the Southwest LRT line. Thank you. Thank you. Are there additional questions or comments from council members? All right, then I'd entertain a motion to approve business item 2021-239. Cummings moves approval. It's moved by Cummings. Is there a second? Zarin seconds. Seconded by Zarin. Is there any other discussion? Seeing and hearing none. Becky, could you call the roll, please? Chambliss. Aye. Cummings. Aye. Ferguson. Fredson. Aye. Gonzalez. Aye. Sterner. Aye. Zirin. Aye. Barber. Aye. With that, the motion carries. Thank you very much, Jim. And that concludes our business for the evening. Um, as far as consent, I would propose that items one and three move on consent to the full council and the budget amendment as usual would go to the full council. If there's no disagreement. All right, hearing none, um, we'll move on to our information item. Our information item is the Metro E-Line draft corridor plan. We have Kaya O'Donnell Burroughs here tonight to present. Uh, good afternoon, chair and committee members. Um, yeah. and I'll just wait for the, uh, there we go. Um, so as you say, my name is Kyle O'Donnell Burroughs uh, and I'm here to provide an update on the E-Line corridor, uh, on the E-Line draft corridor plan. Uh, prior to its release uh, for public comment next week, uh, we'll plan to cover at a high level uh, what will be included in that plan, um, as well as uh, our approach to public engagement on the plan and some of the planning history on the E-Line, <clears throat> excuse me, that, that got us to this point. So thank you for having me here this afternoon. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, before we get too far into the details, I do want to provide a quick overview uh, of the E-Line corridor. Um, so the E-Line will substantially replace the existing Route 6 uh, and will run from University of Minnesota uh, area via 4th and University um, through downtown and uptown uh, by Hedepin Avenue, uh, and then to on to the Southdale Transit Center uh, through the Chain of Lakes area and Linden Hills um, and then uh, France Avenue. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, route 6 is one of our highest ridership routes. Uh, before the pandemic, it was the fifth highest ridership route uh, in Metro Transit system. Um, during the pandemic, it has remained a high ridership corridor, uh, a high ridership route. Um, um, it is one of our core local routes um, that tends to have a lot of different trip purposes and trip types that uh, uh, has proven to be, uh, you know, relatively robust to uh, the shock of the pandemic. Um, the e line is a fully funded project and uh, targeted for opening in 2025. Um, and we have a $60 million, <clears throat> $60 million preliminary budget, uh, which will be refined, obviously, as, as the project continues to advance. Um, next slide, please. Um, and then I want to take us into a little bit of the, the early planning on the uh, E-Line. Um, in 2012, actually, the 
you know, arterial transway corridor study determined that the Hennepin Avenue corridor, as it was known at that point, uh, was a good candidate for BRT implementation, but that um, additional study was needed to uh, sort of refine the potential alignment um, and uh, its relationship to the existing local bus network. And so in 2018 and 19, we initiated the um, E-Line corridor study to essentially do that refinement um, and evaluate a number of uh, potential E-Line alternative alignments, um, as well as develop concept station locations at sort of a conceptual intersection level and the uh, service plan for, <clears throat> excuse me, for both the E-Line and for the uh, proposed modified Route 6, which would operate um, once the E-Line began operation. And that service plan, concept service plan, includes the E-Line running at every uh, 10 minutes for most of the day, uh, just like the rest of our arterial BRT network, uh, and then has uh, the modified Route 6 running uh, every 20 minutes for most of the day from uh, Minnesota Drive and France Avenue, south of the Southdale Transit Center, um, along Xerxes Avenue, um, and then into uptown and downtown um, via Hennepin Avenue. And that essentially retains um, what the Route 6 does um, on that segment today from Minnesota Drive to downtown. Uh, and then the Route 6 would be uh, discontinued on, on France Avenue and then north of downtown on uh, Fourth University, replaced uh, by the E-Line. Um, and you probably recall that uh, the E-Line alignment um, was adopted by the Metropolitan Council uh, following the completion of this study back in uh, January of 2020. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so following the completion of that corridor study, we uh, began work on the draft corridor plan, which is um, sort of what, we're, uh, what we'll be releasing for public comment uh, next week. Um, following the public comment period um, through October on the draft uh, corridor plan, we will plan to you know, make the uh, revisions as, as needed to that plan and come back to the council in January to author, authorize a release of the recommended corridor plan uh, for, for public comment. Um, and then following that public comment period, we'll come back uh, to, we'll seek council action to approve the, the final corridor plan in the spring of, of 2022. Uh, at that point, we'll then transition into the engineering phase of the project um, and target uh, construction beginning in 2024. Um, next slide, please. And so now getting into kind of the meat of the draft corridor plan, um, we'll review that at a high level. Obviously, each station has um, much more detail that will be available um, for everyone's review uh, next week. Um, but at a high level, um, the, what is included in the draft corridor plan is um, essentially the, the plan station locations uh, for each station along uh, on the E-line alignment. And then with, uh, at that station location, where are the specific platforms for that station going to be located at that intersection? Um, will they be near side or far side or around the corner, et cetera? Um, you can see here, this, this slide shows an example <clears throat> of what the, of one aspect of how that looks in, in the plan um, is an aerial view of the proposed um, platform locations at 39th and Sheridan. Um, and this piece of information here, this level of information kind of indicating where the platforms are uh, in red on the aerial uh, will be included for every station within within the E-line. Um, and then for many um, stations, we'll include some additional information, which uh, is on the next slide. So if you can head to the next slide, please. Great. Uh, so the, the real core element uh, of the plan that many uh, many stations will show kind of at that at this conceptual level is a, a comparison between um, the existing condition at that intersection and then what the what would change what the what the um, intersection could look like with the implementation of the e line, including that platform location, and then you know starting to show conceptually what the what the design look like uh, might look like. So here you can see at um, 39th and Sheridan, a little bit more detail about how the platforms might look and interact with the intersection and sidewalk, et cetera. And so this level of information will <clears throat> be included for all of the station locations within uh, the E-line that are not 
um, associated with a, um, a project that, uh, a coordinated project that um, on that particular roadway segment um, that's being led by um, one of our partner agencies, either city or county um, or uh, MnDOT in, in one particular case. And in those cases, um, stations included in, in those coordinated projects, um, the design uh, is kind of being advanced through through those projects in a little bit more detail. And so we don't produce um, these conceptual um, layouts in the draft corridor plan. Uh, though, of course, there are public comment um, periods and, um, and public comment processes through those associated plans as well. <clears throat> Uh, and of course, I think an important caveat to note uh, with this information here is that these, um, you know, are conceptual and uh, these concept designs will continue to evolve as we advance the project through um, design and engineering phase of the project, as we start to get into more, more detailed development and as well as um, continued coordination with our um, agency partners and, and right-of-way owners. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, speaking a little bit more detail on that um, coordination, coordinated projects piece, uh, there are actually quite a number of, um, of projects in various stages of um, design, uh, planning, or construction um, along the E-Line corridor. Um, and as I noted, the planning for those station locations within those other <clears throat> uh, roadway projects has typically advanced through coordination with those projects. And those station plans specifically are not uh, included in the in the corridor plan. Though I do want to emphasize this, the platform location. So the, if you recall, kind of back in terms of the, the aerial view uh, indicating where the platform would be at the intersection is included for uh, for these projects as well. So folks will have uh, an understanding of where we intend the platforms to be, uh, if not a little bit more of that advanced conceptual level detail. Um, and then the other thing to note here as well is that uh, we are uh, coordinating with the city of Minneapolis and Hennepin County uh, through these other projects um, on potential bus only lanes and implementation of, um, of other bus priority treatments um, as, uh, as those kind of projects are um, continuing uh, to be developed. Obviously, uh, I think notably the uh, Hennepin downtown, uh, sorry, excuse me, the uh, Kind of in South project um, between um, Uptown Transit Station, Lake Street area, and um, Franklin and Douglas is a, sort of the key, key element of, of that piece of coordination there, though others are uh, in progress as well. Um, next slide, please. Um, and so our public um, engagement strategy is really focused. Um, uh, sort of online is kind of the key focus there. We'll, we'll, be, we'll have a, um, uh, the public comment period will, will begin next week and, and continue through uh, the end of October, October 31st. Um, and our, our real effort there will be driving people to the, the project website. Uh, and that website will be um, fairly robust. It will have uh, the plan itself, obviously, for uh, review and, and download if, if folks are interested to read through the entire plan. Um, as well as having individual pages, web pages for each <clears throat> individual E-Line station um, showing uh, those aerial views or the, um, the existing condition and, um, um, and, co and concept um, uh, and plan station area concept um, uh, for folks to review in a little bit more detail sort of um, at, at more accessible way than, than having to kind of scroll through an entire plan to just to get to the, the station or two that they that they care about specifically. Um, and those pages will link to a survey um, with uh, folks being able to pro provide com uh, comment directly on on those particular stations. Um, you know, some of the, the primary techniques we'll be um, we'll be using, I think we'll be we'll be using a direct mailer um, postcard going out um, to um, residents and, and businesses along the along the corridor. Um, we, of course, have a, a number of um, uh, subscription lists, both of the E-Line project update list, as well as our, our rider alerts and some other email lists that we uh, will utilize um, 
and um, are also targeting some in-person feedback and, and in-person informing about the project in particular um, at bus stops. Um, getting out and obviously being uh, cognizant of uh, you know current pandemic situation, but um, I'm wanting to make sure that we're meeting people where they are uh, out in our system as well. Um, and then partnering with community organizations and neighborhood groups along the corridor to um, be participating in their uh, in their meetings and events, etc. Flyers and social media, of course, will be a big piece as well. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and then just to, uh, kind of reiterating here our, our next steps in the overall project schedule. So we'll be, uh, as, I've, as I've noted here, releasing the draft corridor plan uh, next week. It'll go live on, on our website uh, next week, and then that'll be accompanied with a big uh, with a communications push uh, through those channels as well. Um, and then seeking feedback through the end of October. Uh, and then as I noted previously, we'll be taking that feedback and developing the recommended corridor plan uh, as uh, for uh, council action to release for public comment uh, in January, and then coming back to the council for final <clears throat> final plan approval in March of 2022, uh, and then uh, construction in 2024 and 20 and, and 25. And with that, I will stand for um, questions or, or comments. Thank you, Kyle. Are there any questions from council members? awfully quiet um but i'm not sure if it's just my screen not responding so um so i'll just make a comment i'm really excited to see this project moving forward and see the continued build out of our our abrt um a system it's really exciting and you guys have just done such a nice job of planning and every time you do this you improve on the public outreach and how you're doing it and meeting the community where they are and i think that you know we really want to make sure that you all recognize for what what the team there has done with all of this over time. It's it's really impressive. Um, all right, um, any other questions or comments? Just did all to what you just said, uh, Chair Barber. Thank Thanks you. A lot. Yeah, it's always nice when you to come with good news and leave us smiling, Kyle. <laughs> uh, happy to do it, any, any opportunity I get. Awesome, well, thank you very much. And yeah, keep us posted, especially after um, you go out for public comment. We'd love to hear um, some feedback of, of what the community thinks, because this is a, a very, a big part of the connections throughout the system. So very good. Great. All right, Great. Um, if there's nothing else from other council members. All right, then we are actually done for the evening. So you get a little time back, which is not always the case with transportation committees. So enjoy it. And with that, we are adjourned. Thank you all.